Um, so we're going to talk uh, today about uh, energy efficiency in particular, uh, particularly in the building sector. This is something that we at the Jeff uh, have uh, given uh, quite a lot of attention over the last few cycles. And so we're very excited today uh, to uh, have uh, a number of distinguished speakers uh, and to be uh, able to sort of collect their uh, their thoughts on how to advance the agenda of uh, buildings and energy efficiency. And we've seen a lot of uh, announcement recently on uh, uh, net zero, a lot of countries that are moving in that direction. Uh, however, we haven't yet seen those uh, targets translated into uh, real implementable, enforceable uh, policies, or at least not uh, in as many countries and, and as many local governments and as many cities as we would like uh, to see. Uh, and we know that buildings uh, and, and energy efficiency in building can play a critical role uh, to help countries meet the Paris Agreement ambition uh, with about 40% of energy consumption and uh, a third of, uh, of, global, of global emissions. Um, so for the sector to align with the Paris Agreement, uh, we have to uh, basically cut emissions uh, in a half uh, by 2030 in terms of embodied carbon and uh, reach net zero in terms of operational issues. Uh, all new buildings will need to be zero carbon in 2050, both on the embodied side and on operational sides. Um, so, without further ado, I would like to start uh, the session today with two presentations. Uh, we have with us uh, Brian Motherway, who is the head of energy efficiency at the International Energy Agency. Uh, please, Brian, would you like to join us? And we also have Jennifer Leike, uh, who is a friend and is also the director uh, of energy at the World Resources Institute. Uh, and I would also invite her to join uh, to join us. Um, so I would like to ask our colleague uh, if we can have the presentation on the screen. And here you go. And uh, we have a clicker. So please, Brian, floor is yours. Uh, thank you, Filippo, and hello, everybody. Thank you also to Filippo and Patricia and all our friends in GEF for hosting the event today. It's great to be here among so many friends and to recognize many familiar faces, but also many new ones. Uh, it's really great that we're focusing on energy efficiency and in buildings, uh, and I'm looking forward to hearing from the great panelists lined up. And my job really is to do a couple of things. First of all, to say uh, thank you for the collaboration with GEF and, and to say that we're really delighted to be working so closely with GEF and WRI and many partners that are here today. Uh, and secondly, to show you a few slides that give a little bit of an overview uh, of where we are in buildings that set the scene for the, for the discussion that's going to follow. And let me start with something that's not on my slides, but I want to stress. We, COP is going very well. It's been a very interesting few days, lots of really good pledges, some great financial pledges yesterday, great progress on methane, great progress on, on powering past coal. Some of us were just at an event where many governments have signed up to really great new pledges on product efficiency, which we'll talk about, I'm sure, during this session. But in 2021, we, which we are now in, we will see the second biggest rise in greenhouse gas emissions that in the last four decades. So. Pledges are good, promises are good, let's see some action. We, we're, we're not got yet going in the right direction and we really need to focus on that. And that's why the IEA published the Net Zero Roadmap to talk about what 2050 needs to look like. There's more than one path to Net Zero, uh, but, but we wanted to show the kind of extent of very many measures and actions that governments and businesses and all of us as citizens need to be contemplating if we're going to deliver on this commitment we're collectively entering into. Um, and this, this shows the milestones on the path to net zero by 2050, looking at the deep cuts needed in all sectors and the very strong actions. And what I want to really emphasize is the importance of the first decade. Let's forget about 2050. Uh, I'll be in my late middle age by then, and, and it seems very far away. But uh, as Vincent and I heard, uh, just coming from another event, 2030 is 425 weeks away. 
by the time we leave COP, it'll be 424 weeks away. So time is marching on, and, and particularly for energy efficiency, because it's ready. There are many technologies, policies, measures really ready to go. Uh, the technology is mature in so many areas. It's fully cost effective. It, we really need to lead our clean energy transitions with energy efficiency. Uh, and that, of course, uh, centers on investment. We see clean energy investment growing, but not nearly at the pace that we need to see it uh, growing at. And that's why the pledges we're seeing this week are really important, but we also need to see the next steps on that. And of course, a key point for investment here in 2021 is the alignment between some immediate goals that all governments are facing and these, these uh, wider societal existential uh, challenges we're facing. One, of course, key being jobs. Clean energy transitions is very jobs intensive. All sectors of clean energy create many jobs. And the one that creates the most jobs is energy efficiency. Energy efficiency employs people in construction, in manufacturing, in services, and it can do so very quickly. And based on every unit of investment uh, deployed by governments and the private sector in energy efficiency, it can really drive job creation, economic stimulus, economic recovery, and it can do it quickly and effectively. And it can do it in ways that lock in efficiency. We're at a crucial moment now because many economies are starting to grow. Many parts of the world are building a lot of buildings at the rate we're going now, between now and 2050, every week we will add the building stock equivalent of the city of Paris. One new city of Paris worth of buildings every week over the next few decades. And they are going to be either efficient and low carbon or inefficient and carbon intensive. And that's the choice of today, not 2030, not 2050, the choice of today. What do the, the policies that governments put in place, what are the strategies that businesses put in place to decide what happens and will determine the future? Um, I won't get into too much of technical details, except to say we're on a path to, in both the buildings themselves and what we put in those buildings in terms of appliances, heating systems, cooling systems, we need to see acceleration. Let me not dwell on too many charts. Let me just say about policy and, and on two sides. First of all, on buildings. We know that buildings policies work. We know that building codes work. We know that mandatory standards work. We know that retrofit works, retrofit standards work. We just need to see more of it. For countries that haven't got those kind of policies in place, it's a real opportunity to lock in gains for consumers, for business, for, for society as a whole, and for the planet as a whole. For those countries that have policies in place, you need to strengthen them. Nobody can rest on their laurels here. We need stronger policies. On the appliance side, I could talk about money, but I'll talk about cooling, um, air conditioners, and, and this is something we, we were discussing earlier, but right, I, I like to use these facts and figures. But anyway, every second, four air conditioners are sold somewhere in the world, uh, particularly in emerging markets where o ownership rates are very low compared to uh, some advanced countries, but they're growing very, very fast. And the important thing about those air conditioners is they're generally not very efficient, not only compared to the really best stuff, but even to other stuff available in the market. So there's no market in the world where the average air conditioner is not less than half as if, how many negatives? Let me put it another way. In every market in the world, the typical air conditioner being sold is less than half as efficient as the best one. So somebody, for whatever reason, is choosing to buy an air con conditioner that's going to cost them twice as much to run, going to emit twice as much carbon, going to put twice as much burden on the energy system. Well, I'm sure we'll discuss some of the issues around that, but it's a real key early opportunity for much greater, faster progress uh, on energy efficiency. And I'm not even talking about the huge developments we're seeing in terms of like the global co cooling challenge that's, that's moving up standards five times cur current standards today. So cooling is a re real key sector, I'm sure we'll discuss it. Um, I want to say two things before I close. We have the evidence that efficiency policy works. And this graph shows that, that for those countries who have been in the business of efficiency standards for appliances the longer, the longest, for who have had minimum performance standards for efficiency appliances for decades, the typical washing machine, refrigerator, lighting system is using half the electricity it would otherwise be using because the markets have shifted, companies have responded, uh, consumers have responded. Not only that, but the appliances are actually getting cheaper to buy. So consumers are saving on the purchase price the saving on the running costs, electricity systems don't have to grow as quickly, emissions don't have to grow as quickly. There's a real body of evidence now that these policies work, we just need to see more of it. I just want to make one more point 
which I'm sure we'll discuss, uh, and others have more expertise than I, than I, which is, as well as conventionally thinking about how much energy does an appliance use, how much energy does a building use, we really need to think about the coming age of a much more dynamic, connected energy system, particularly in electricity driven by digital technologies. It's going to create many new opportunities to not just think about lowering energy demand as a whole, but also having a much more flexible, dynamic system, which means we can make the best use of cheap, clean renewables when they're available, we can lower demand when those resources are not available, when more expensive re resources need to be used. So we really, really need to think about this in an integrated way. And I think the cutting edge there is cities. So they can really think about smart cities, smart grids, and this is something we've been working on this year with the G20, where the government of Italy have really taken a great leadership position to, to start thinking about how can governments put the right policies in place that will drive investment in the kind of grids, smart technologies, appliances of the future that will really unlock the great efficiency potential we see across all parts of the building sector and beyond uh, in energy efficiency. So. Uh, we really believe this has, this has more uh, to do. We understand that, that efficiency policies can be challenging. Governments find it hard sometimes to understand uh, how, how to act. But that's why the discussions today are really important. We'll hear from business, we'll hear from experts, and equally the IEA is keen to continue to work with everybody represented here so that we can all explore not just the theory of energy efficiency, but the practice. How do we implement faster and stronger in the coming years and decades starting uh, next week at T minus 424. Thank you very much. Well, thank you. Thank you very much, Brian, for, for your, your remarks. I mean, I picked up a couple of uh, interesting points. First of all, to start thinking of the time that we have left uh, in the decade in weeks uh, instead of months, instead of uh, uh, years might be, might be helpful. Uh, and also the point on clean jobs, and, and that's a point that it couldn't be emphasized enough. Uh, we, we see a lot of discussion around co-benefits, uh, around the restart in the economies, and I think energy efficiency and some of the studies that you've uh, produced at the IEA have shown that you know, for every million invested that you can generate 15, 15 jobs in, in, in building retrofits. And, and I think that's a, a number that really uh, stands out uh, and, and is worth mentioning again. Uh, moving to uh, Jennifer, um, I wonder if we can have the uh, Jennifer's presentation uh, on, the, on the screen. All right, uh, Jennifer, the floor is yours. Checking, there we go. Uh, hello, thank you so much, Filippo. Thank you, Brian, for your opening comments. Thank you to the GEF for being a long-term ally and supporter uh, of bringing the building efficiency work into the fore, into our political conversation here at COP and elsewhere, and for the broader view of what we need to do to bring both the development agenda and the environmental agendas together. So I'm grateful for your leadership. I'm going to pick up on a few points that Brian raised, um, but because we've gone through a lot of facts and figures, I'll go light on telling you about mine here, and we'll talk a little bit more about what are the implications of this and what does it mean. Uh, World Resources Institute began our journey with building efficiency in 2014. We were concerned, as all of us ought to be, uh, around the fact that we had the entire construction sector that was not yet part of the global climate agenda. We were concerned about the, the rising emissions that we saw and the lifespan of buildings as they were being built, so the lock-in effects that were going to be, uh, we were going to have to navigate and manage if we were to reach our goals. But I also want to note that it was very clear early on that this agenda was one of the agendas that was most linked to people and the sustainable development goals. And if we were to begin to tackle buildings, we really could capture those co-benefits. So we worked much more closely on the question of what does it take to do the implementation of these kinds of uh, policies, these kinds of actions of engaging the sector for change. So we've, we really, have built a, an agenda that is about cities and creating affordable, reliable, clean electricity and providing buildings that were safe, healthy, and uh, energy efficient. <laughs> we know that the important link here for housing and shelter 
is one that we must, if we're looking at just uh, equitable energy options that we can bring forward. Heat is a major concern and the need for air conditioning and the dramatic rise in the use of air conditioning has a significant climate implication and health implication. So we have to think about cities and buildings as part of an integrated strategy around people and making people's lives better. I've never met anyone who didn't have a wish list of things they'd like to do to their home, the way that they, the places they'd like to work in. So how do we make that vision something that is a political opportunity? I think we're getting there. I think this is the first time where we've really built a vision that talks about cities as part of a human response in addition to that, uh, the climate opportunities. And I want to just say we published just recently, if you haven't seen it, uh, a World Resources Report uh, that focuses specifically on building out better cities, more inclusive cities, bringing healthier cities for people. So our cities program was uh, a, a called the Building Efficiency Accelerator. For those of you who don't know it, it's been a, a leading voice, peer-to-peer -peer voice for creating change. And that focused on policy, on projects and on tracking progress and having significant activities that could be linked between the national government and the subnational governments because the subnational governments are the ones on the front line of permitting and managing for construction. National governments often are helping set the standards that local governments implement. And so when we think about this, we recognized that the cities had a huge powerful play, play in this space. And their play was not just about, um, about the climate agenda, it was really about sustainable development. So that was our building efficiency accelerator. I'm gonna pivot now to talk about what we're, what we're doing next and how we're thinking about this. Two things are important. One, we know in the conversations that we're having at COP that it's not just about the operations of these buildings, that in fact the materials choices and the upstream and downstream must be linked together, right? That we're looking at whole life cycle, that we need to get to material selection. So we're looking and moving towards the approach that allows us to make, to look at commitments in, those, in both areas, to assessments in both areas, developing the agenda for uh, and zero carbon energy uh, and zero carbon buildings, um, to the implementation and the improvement cycle, right? Thinking about this in a holistic way. The importance of that is that we can actually take what we've built, which is a very large platform of cities, and you'll hear from some of them today, and thinking through where and how you take forward the policy agenda that takes you to the next level. Cities have an opportunity. There are two things that cities do. One, they're consumers of energy system that they don't control most of the time. Some of them do, but not most of them. But two, they control the infrastructure, that the choices that they have. So we can more than, if we really focus, we can get 87% if we did both electricity system change and then we could take the rest of this out from our buildings and the decarbonization of things that are in cities control. Our Coalition for Urban Transitions report highlighted that last year and I urge you to take a look at that because cities as a critical actor in this space. So thinking about that whole life cycle picture, we're moving into a zero carbon building world, right? That's the, that's the frontier. We're not there in terms of implementation, but we're building roadmaps to get there. The World Green Building Council, the Global Alliance for Buildings and Construction, all very active leaders in this space. So it's both private sector and it's around intergovernmental engagement in this space. So the Zero Carbon Building Accelerator is working in Turkey and in Colombia to help link the city agenda with two pilot cities on zero carbon buildings approaches. And in this first six months, we've already defined national baseline assessments and done gap analyses. And we're working with local and national stakeholder experts across the sectors to identify those transformative actions that would allow cities to succeed in implementing zero carbon building goals. And that work will be uh, coming forward in the next two years but it's only one example of where the zero carbon building space could take us. So I'm gonna conclude my remarks by just saying how important this journey is and how, it, how critical it is that we think about this not just as an intervention, um, but as a way of linking our sustainable development goals, bringing this to people's lives and making the climate agenda meaningful for them.
Thank you, thank you, Jennifer. Um, always uh, very inspiring to hear from you. And uh, I particularly like the link you make between uh, energy efficiency and the human side uh, of, uh, of things, and the, the idea of increasing the comfort of how people live to increasing their health. Uh, which is a link that, uh, you know, post-pandemic, we're going to have to continue to pay some attention to. And in general, the idea of more livable, more livable cities. Uh, there are interesting links here also with uh, other agendas, in particular, some work we are doing on circular economy. Uh, and when it comes to embodied carbon, that's uh, going to have something that um, I think is also an exciting space. And finally, exciting to hear updates from the uh, Zero Carbon Building Accelerator that we've uh, worked together on. And uh, and to be able to hear more from some of the uh, panelists that we are going to have with us. So, uh, with this, uh, I would uh, perhaps um, invite the, ne the, sec the second segment uh, of our event, and I will give a round of applause to Jennifer and Brian for their participation. Okay, so. After um, the first two presentations, uh, I would like now to uh, invite, uh, to announce the, the second uh, round of uh, speakers. We have remotely connected uh, His Excellency Jorge Rivera, who is the Energy Secretary of uh, Panama, uh, is uh, on the uh, link, it will be uh, with us in a second. Uh, we have the pleasure to have uh, Saida Rodriguez, who is the head of the Ministry um, of Sustainable Development of the State of Yucatan. Um, we also have uh, Carolina Urritia, the Secretary of Environment of the City of Bogota, who is one of the cities that is participating uh, on the BEA. Uh, uh, Vincent Petit, who is a Senior Vice President for Global Strategy Perspective at Schneider Electric, and also uh, has the pleasure of representing the entire private sector on uh, on the panel. Uh, and finally, we, last but not least, we have Melanie Slade, who is a senior project man program manager at the International Energy Agency. Um, so I would like to start, um, since we talked about the, the building uh, Accelerator, and since we know that Bogota is one of the cities that is uh, participating not only on the uh, BEA but also on the Zero Carbon Building Accelerator, um, we'd like to hear from Carolina first on, uh, you know, how local action plans can align with uh, national building decarbonization roadmaps. So perhaps you could share with us some thoughts on how the BEA and the Zero Carbon Building Accelerator are contributing to advance uh, your climate ambition, your climate objectives, and uh, uh, how you think that experience can be useful for other cities as well. Thank you very much. So I think, first of all, there's very few opportunities in which the stars align and magically timing works out. And I think that's what happened with these two initiatives uh, and the way they've worked for Bogota. Uh, we started with both initiatives, I believe, in 2019. And one of the most interesting parts is that they didn't start working with the Environment Secretariat, which is the one I, I work in, but with the Planning Secretariat. So it was actually um, very interesting to see planning and the ones that actually work on urban codes and construction codes working on these issues rather than have it the Environmental uh, Secretariat, which usually coordinates all actions uh, around climate change, sort of develop these uh, this initiative because it was a lot more useful. They posed themselves more useful questions, I have to say, uh, than we would have posed <laughs> from the environment corner. And now that we're actually working on proposing our land use plan, they, they tried to put forth a land use plan using some of this information in 2019, but the program had just begun. So the stars aligned, and it was very use useful to actually have these two years of thought having p been put in into, into buildings and energy efficiency so that we started to formulate a new version of our climate action plan and our land use plan at the same time. And we had a lot more information, and we, we had a lot more information also on how this was being thought of from the national level. Because I do have to agree with you, I'm not sure how useful it is to think of these issues at the national level, except for one key thing. I think in climate change, we have transport and energy, which are li largely driven by national policy. 
and by the pub public sector, but then we also have agriculture and housing where the private sector plays a much more larger role. We of course have regulation, um, but especially when thinking about existing buildings and not new buildings, we need to work with the owners of the buildings <laughs> and of course with the ones who are building the new ones. So, and this is action that it takes place mainly through policies for subsidies and how we invest public resources in a very intelligent way in terms of subsidies. I think we don't think about that enough, especially when we think about low cost public housing. Um, because there tends to be a whole debate, if we put in climate factors and energy efficiency into public housing, are we going to make it more expensive? And I think we have to sort of do away with that rationale, and that's part of the discussion we've been having in, the, in, in energy efficiency for buildings, because it may be a little more expensive to build, but it's gonna be so much cheaper to live there. And that's what we want when we're combining uh, thinking on poverty and public housing. So, that's been one of the fortunes that we have. I think, to be honest with you, we don't have enough answers on retrofitting. We just don't. We don't know how we're going to do it. There's lots of architects putting thought into it. Um, Bogota is very fortunate. When you visit, you might not think so. It's a little grayer than you'd think about a tropical city. But um, we don't need air conditioning because we're not too hot. And we don't need heating because we're not too cold. Um, we, of course, have to fight this sort of elitist thinking that air conditioning is cool, and so the office buildings should be all closed up and then have air conditioning, because it is a trend that's taking hold, uh, and we have to fight it through regulation. But other than that, heating and, and air conditioning aren't a, a big question for us, but we do have a lot of questions regarding energy efficiency and retrofitting. And honestly, I've been to a lot of events here and I'm not seeing enough answers in, certain, in terms of retrofitting. We have great promises in terms of new buildings, but we have a built city with eight million people in it and we have to find a way to make existing buildings a little more efficient. Um, we have challenges uh, in terms of on-site renewable energies in Bogota. There's not enough answers on that yet. But I think the fact that we're working on our climate action plan and that we're working on our land use plan at the same time and that our land use plan is giving us two years to put forth not only a new construction co code, but now a solely sustainable construction co code for the city. And we're gonna need a lot of support on that. So if any funders are interested, uh, it's a very expensive initiative to put in sustainable thinking into the whole of our construction codes. And we have two years to do it. Um, but it's going to be very interesting to see the political support for the climate change emergency, a whole new land use plan, and support from international organizations such as yourselves going into play when at such a needy time for sustainable construction. Well, thank you, thank you very much uh, for for these. I've a uh, <laughs> lot of lot of super interesting uh, thoughts there and. Personally, I've enjoyed the weather in Bogota, uh, so <laughs> I, I have to say that perhaps... I love it, <laughs> but it's not sunny. <laughs> well, that might help in terms of energy efficiency and perhaps some passive design that can be, uh, sort of can maximize the energy savings uh, when, it comes, uh, when it comes to buildings. Thank you for that. Uh, I'd like to see if we can uh, join onto the um, web link uh, with uh, Secretary Rivera, um, and I'm looking at our... Yes? Hello. Oh, hi. Secretary Rivera, thank you very much. Uh, can you hear us fine? I can hear you loud and clear. Perfect. Well, first of all, just say thank you very much for taking the time to be with us today. Uh, we're very happy uh, that, uh, that uh, you can share some thoughts with us. We know Panama is uh, targeting an accelerated clean energy transition uh, to drive recovery from COVID-19 and generate significant economic, social, and environmental benefits. Uh, so I was wondering uh, if you could share some thoughts on how energy efficiency fit um, within Panama's green recovery agenda and the broader work that you are doing uh, for your NDC. Thank you, thank you uh, very much for the, the opportunity. Um, uh, I wanted to give you some, some a little bit of context of how is, is Panama mostly our, our capital city. 
And uh, uh, by contrast with Bogota, we live in a, a city that is uh, really hot and really humid. We have around 30, 30 degrees uh, Celsius average in the day, during the day, and um, around 70% of humidity. So it, we, we, live, we, we say that we live in the future regarding to air conditioning um, because around 25% of our um, electricity consumption uh, comes from uh, air conditioning in our country. You can see it clearly in our uh, electric system um, load core uh, around 8 a.m. in the morning, 9 a.m. it goes up to a plateau and this uh, a plateau keeps until like five, six, seven uh, uh, p.m. in the afternoon, around uh, uh, 25 percent of increase in this uh, load curve. So for us, it's a key issue, um, both from decarbonization, even though we have around 75 percent of our electricity matrix comes from renewables, we wanted to go further with that. That's why we have an energy transition agenda that includes as a key pillar uh, energy efficiency. This uh, transition agenda was approved last year um, by the cabinet of the ministers, and it implies five specific strategies for um, the electricity sector, renewables, uh, electric mobility, uh, distributed generation, universal access, and of course, energy efficiency, it's, a, it's one of the pillars. And in this energy transition agenda is aligned with the uh, SDGs, and uh, mostly the SDG 7 and the, the commitments that we sent uh, <clears throat> under the Paris Agreement uh, community, the NDCs. So I, I want to tell you that um, this, the NDC commitments on um, emissions reductions, 95% of our country commitment on that comes from the energy sector. And around 20% uh, of these uh, compromises of energy-related uh, emissions reduction come from energy efficiency. So that is a key issue. We have a, a energy efficiency law uh, that backs uh, 2012, respecting next year to update and upgrade that uh, piece of legislation. Um, because we're working right now, as I mentioned, one of the key strategies of the energy transition agenda is related to energy efficiency, and it will uh, imply adjustments to, the, to this regulation that we have uh, from uh, 2012. I can give you some examples of the analysis that we have uh, performed uh, um, of this, uh, the impact, economic impact of this energy transition agenda, and we expect that um, we could create around 15 new jobs to the year uh, 2024 in around two to three years. And if we you know, project that um, data to 2050, we expect to create around um, 100,000, 140,000 new jobs related to energy transition. And from that whole, we think that uh, we estimate that around 13% uh, of all these new jobs will come from energy efficiency in the next, uh, in the short term, the mid term, and the long term. So this is something that we expect to to have. We expect to have a penetration of energy efficiency equipment around 35% in 2024 and 72% uh, in 2000. Uh, 50. We expect around uh, total investment in energy efficiency in around 77 million dollars, and most of most uh, the majority of these investments are will, will are related to buildings, are related to uh, air conditioning mostly. So we think that, that we have um, um, a specific approach to to end my intervention right now is that. We have in this uh, in economic impact of the energy transition agenda, we have done uh, an, a very pragmatical, very practical um, approach. We have set and identified all the packages, the stimulus packages that we have from our government to our uh, private sector, and we have uh, done this uh, adaptation uh, for this 
uh, recovery to mostly um, um, directed to small and, and, and medium businesses. And we expect that around 33 million to one, uh, 150 million of all these packages could be allocated to energy efficiency uh, measures related to the economic recovery of the, of the country as a whole. Well, thank you. Thank you very much. That sounds like a very ambitious uh, uh, plan uh, you have there, and uh, uh, in the context of your of your NDCs um, for energy efficiency in general, I wonder if you have any uh, insights, uh, in particular when it comes to building, or any example of uh, a building-related energy efficiency policies that you would like to share with us, or some of the challenges that that you've encountered in uh, in adopting uh, that particular piece of legislation or regulation yes yes we have we have approved uh, in 2019 and a specific um, uh, sustainable building regulation it defines parameters for res residential buildings offices and tertiary buildings where through passive measures focused on walls windows uh, wall size, radio, uh, shape factors, and air conditioning, we have to uh, uh, at least 15% of energy efficiency from the designing of the building. This piece of, of regulation, it is a, a, a framework regulation that had to be applied to the uh, specific uh, municipalities in our country that has the... the, the uh, responsibility to approve our uh, codes for construction, for buildings. So we are working with them, with the municipalities, in order to um, uh, apply this, this uh, regulation. But already we have um, a, a lot of, um, of uh, the construction companies and a lot of the developers that are working with us. Uh, we started with the um, uh, lightning, for example, we could give you an example of, of, of lighting. Around 100% of the buildings built in, in the last five years in Panama, all of them use uh, LED technology. And we uh, are doing this uh, process of changing them to the, to the lighting, to the existing building. We have currently around 50 buildings with LED certifications, and we have around 108 buildings not right now in the process of certifying themselves this certification process for lead certification so we we are working with that we have you know um, a mix of uh, mandatory measures and standards and we have a lot of standards that are um, for uh, uh, excellency for them and, and we're working both with them you know uh, i would this would be some of the examples i could give you right now for how we are developing this uh, from the building side, the designing of the buildings, the uh, existing ones and the uh, new ones that we're going to build in, in the coming years. Well, thank you. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Secretary Rivera. Uh, passive measures, uh, building design standards and uh, appliances standards. I think that's a good, uh, it's, it's a very good uh, uh, menu uh, of, uh, of measures. Um, I would like now to move on to perhaps the uh, provider uh, of, uh, of uh, solutions. Uh, and uh, we have with us uh, Vincent Petit, um, the Senior Vice President for Schneider Electric. Um, you know much better than, than, than we do. The building environment has evolved uh, quite a lot uh, in the last few years. Uh, digital technologies being uh, now a key part of uh, our uh, sort of race to zero emissions. Um, for instance, gathering intelligence on carbon metrics, uh, on standards, targets, but also demand-side management uh, and real-time monitoring of performance are just a few things that come to mind. So. Moving from product to system efficiency, uh, how do you envis envision the role of uh, digital technology for the build environment, and how can they help us in the race to zero? Okay, thank you. So, uh, look, in one word, uh, um, and then I will expand, uh, considerable. Uh, I think the role is considerable, and I will repeat uh, 
I'll repeat myself <laughs> from the previous panel we just had with a, with a few people in the room, which I think we don't take enough stock of the potential of those technologies. And you were asking for a solution for retrofit. I give you one. Uh, this is, um, and, and I'll explain a bit on that. This is digital technologies where I think we, you know, modern problems require modern solutions, right? And um, by the way, I acknowledge all the progress that, uh, and all the, the development that has been made in, in both Bogota and Panama City, by the way, because I had the chance to go to the two places in Bogota, actually, three or four times. And I'm not saying that because I want to be re-invited, huh? but, uh, <laughs> but, but I wouldn't. Uh, I, I like, I love the weather. I mean, I have a house in Brittany, it's the same weather. <laughs> so, so, um, so I love the weather. So, uh, but, but anyway, so, so I think, uh, yeah, um, you know, we, we, we deploy a lot of such systems uh, in the building environment. And one of the things that we've realized, and, and you're very correct, I mean, in what you, you said earlier, that there is a huge focus on new buildings, which is very important, by the way. <laughs> Let's not forget it. And I'll come back to that. But on the existing building, it's a key issue, right? Um, but what we realize is that, uh, you know, a lot of the energy efficiency efforts that have been tried in the past, um, some of they failed because, and Brian, you were alluding to that earlier, because, you know, we, got, we are on paybacks that are 15, 20, 25 years for some types of solutions, right? But uh, I'm sorry to say, those, there are new solutions that are a little better. Uh, and what we could find uh, in our research, and by the way, it's public, yeah, so we can, uh, we can share that, uh, is that uh, with digital technologies, you can get, depending on the sector, depending on the region, okay, but you can get basically 20 to 30 percent carbon abatement. So I'm not talking energy, I'm talking carbon, CO2, right? Um, with paybacks that are, in average, below eight years. Uh, and as a matter of fact, so if you go to Europe, it's below five years. If you take commercial buildings, you were talking about commercial buildings as well. Commercial buildings, paybacks are lower. As a matter of fact, if residential is more complicated. Uh, but you still get paybacks that are in, in a 10-year range. And I mean, this is, a, this is a disruptor compared to, to what we've known in the past. So modern issues, you know, let's start to look at modern technologies. And I think we need to take greater stock of the potential uh, of those technologies. And, that, and that's true also for the residential, not only commercial buildings. But that's true very much for commercial buildings, for sure. Uh, you are talking about demand. Ma so that's one thing, one piece of, um, of, 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 of thought, which I think we need to consider more. You are talking about demand change management as well in your question. I think we should spend a lot of time on that. Uh, in the net zero emission scenario from the International Energy Agency, I was very, very glad, congratulations for that, uh, to see a piece on distributed generation. I mean, I think we really, again, should take a lot more stock about this because guess what, you know, uh, solar panels, right, they are made to be installed everywhere where the sun shines. And the sun shines everywhere. So the primary place where we should put solar panels is on the rooftops. And there is a lot of space available and that doesn't eat up land that uh, maybe could be used for other purposes like agriculture and so on. So not to say that we don't need uh, solar farms, huh? but I'm just saying that there is a huge opportunity. Uh, for, for distributed generation, and in the International Energy Agency report, we, we saw a potential, which is 7.5 thousand terawatt hour. Um, it's not the potential, by the way, it's the forecast. Uh, so the potential is, uh, in fact, greater. And just to put that in relation, it's one third of uh, global electricity demand today just to put it in relation. So, so I mean, there is, a, there is a massive untapped opportunity here. And by the way, it comes at a benefit for consumers, especially if you put that on, uh, uh, if, you, if, you, if you support its development, or if you make it mandatory in new buildings, it comes at very little cost, you know, and it's free energy, right? So, so, so I think there, this is another uh, opportunity to transform the buildings, and in fact, to run a transition and accelerate the penetration of renewable energies in a way that is beneficial to consumers. And ultimately, if you want the transition to be fast, 424 weeks, 400 and counting. Uh, uh, so if you want to, it to be fast, uh, the best way is, is to make sure that people are going to be supportive of it. Right? So second, uh, I think second big piece, which I think we need to, to, to discuss a lot more in, in our policy um, uh, making effort uh, and also for the private sector to organize itself, right, to deliver at cost and at scale. Uh, and the last uh, element, if you allow me, 
But then I'll promise I'll be shorter on the next questions if you have any more for me. But since I represent the private sector, I'm alone to, to <laughs> I'm alone, right? So it's okay, it's okay, I can go. So so then let's talk about still a, a bit of uh, the new uh, the new buildings, right? The construction. Because I mean it, it if you take the, the entire scope of greenhouse gas emissions of the of the of the building sector, you, you kinda get like twenty-five to thirty percent of that which comes from construction. And it's pretty huge. And on top of that, by the way, well, or, or part of that, well, construction takes up, what, 75% of cement, okay, 30 to 40% of steel. I mean, it's a, it's a huge channel of emissions, right? So we really need to do something about it. And um, at Schneider, we operate a lot in the building sector, and I, I, I have a story for you. It, it, it's not a very efficient industry, right? It doesn't have ma made a lot of progress in terms of productivity in the last like four decades or five decades or something like this. So, so there is a huge, not everywhere, okay, I mean, it's very fragmented sector as well and so on. So, so there is a big question. How are we going to positively disrupt the construction industry, right? Uh, and again, uh, you got something that exists that is right before our eyes, which is called digital technologies. And again, I mean, there is there are already a lot of things happening, right? Uh, you, look, 30% of the construction work is actually rework, right? We over-specify buildings. We waste materials in construction. All those inefficiencies, you know, that are hidden due to fragmentation and poor uh, control over what's going on in very complex asset building uh, is easily to be solved uh, with digital technologies, you know? New technologies like BIM, digital twins, project control, uh, real time, and so on, worker safety, enfin, you name it, there are plenty of, uh, of things that exist like this which are already um, available. And it's not rocket science to actually deploy that, right? So I think another opportunity. Well, thank you very much, Vincent. I'm uh, going to uh, take your offer uh, of giving us a little bit more substance on some of the example, uh, perhaps in the next uh, question. Um, and something you said about the uh, rooftop solar and distributed energy, I find that obviously very interesting. We need to um, work a little bit more on the public sector there to make sure that uh, uh, utilities uh, and the regulator uh, put in place a sort of a system of incentives that actually make it possible for uh, buildings to communicate with the grid in two ways and, uh, um, uh, and, and for consumers to do the same on their, on their homes. Um, I'd like to turn now uh, to um, Saida. Saida Rodriguez is the head of the Ministry of Sustainable Development of the State of Yucatan, which most of us associate with long, white, uh, sandy uh, beaches uh, and with beautiful forests, uh, extremely rich in biodiversity. Uh, however, uh, that is not the only thing that uh, they have uh, to show for themselves. Uh, in fact, they are the first state, and please correct me if I'm wrong, the first state to have adopted net zero uh, commitments uh, in Mexico. Um, and uh, as a part of that work, uh, we're also very happy that you uh, joined the Building Efficiency Accelerator uh, and the Advancing Net Zero. Um, so the ambitious plan that you have in place uh, look to make sure that all state buildings um, are carbon neutral uh, by 2030. And we'd be very grateful if you could tell us a little bit on uh, how you went to adopt uh, that, uh, that piece of regulation and what were the challenges that you have to face in bringing together the large number of actors on the public and the private side that would allow you to be confident that you can reach uh, those targets once you announce them. Check, checking, yes, that's perfect. Okay, let, let me try to context a, a, a very ambitious question. But yes, uh, Yucatan was the, the first uh, Mexican state that uh, signed the commitment for net zero uh, for, for buildings. So we are uh, at the beginning a little shy and unconfident about how we're going to achieve that. But actually WRI and the BAA um, it help us how to, to do it. What we did was uh, a lot of workshops with the people who manage all the buildings. We do have um, 
2,901 uh, government buildings in Yucatan. So it was an, a huge work to talk uh, the manage and the maintenance group or, or of each building and how to figure it out, how to, to reach that goal. So it happens. Uh, it was, as I said, uh, a lot of work. And, and we developed uh, two things. The first one was the confirmation on the construction code that we already have working, uh, worked in that in, in, in the capital of Merida. The, the capital of Yucatan is Merida. They already got that, that construction, construction code, so it helps and how to, to achieve this. And the second thing was the standard of public uh, policy for the public government buildings. So that was uh, constructed into the, um, a program and how to evaluate, how to, to measure the consumption in each building, and as a result, how to program the, the exchange of lighting to exchange of the air conditioning. Let me get a parenthesis right here because Yucatan is um, one of the hottest states, I think, in, in Mexico. Is um, the governor always say the funny thing that I'm going to share with you, that is in Yucatan we got two seasons, a hotter seasons, a hot a hot season and a hotter season. So it's always hot. We always need an air conditioning. It's a basic need almost in 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 the city. So it was hard to deal to the retrofit of the buildings in in the government buildings and to program this into the very uh, small um, budgets that we have in the, in the public function. So it was a challenge, but uh, right now we do achieve a 10% reduction of emission in the 2,901 building in, in Yucatan. And we are also uh, trying to step up in a couple of buildings, into a smart building uh, in development in, in two buildings specifically, and uh, to generate distribute gen distributed generation in the, in the government palace. So I think that we are not only trying to do things, I think we're achieving. Uh, the most challenging things I believe it is, it was, and it's still being uh, to deal with people, to, to develop this um, sensitivity of the managed people, who, the people who manage the building, the people who are responsible for maintenance, and of course, all the users of the building and how to, to have to understand that only working together, we are going to achieve the goal. So I am convinced that that was the, the hardest part. And to the, into the workshops, uh, I think this is the way to do this. Another thing is an, a challenge, and uh, this challenge could be a good example for everybody, and it could be a challenge even for the private sector, is how to communicate the results because people uh, feel encouraged when you when when they saw the results. So it's very important to have uh, like a like screen that is measuring the and monitoring all the the consumption by day. So that's a that's a, a good example of how to 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 encourage the the energy efficiency at least in public buildings. Mm -hmm. Uh, another thing is how to report and how to convert this into climate change impact. Because only um, using the methods of uh, amount of consumption reduced is not enough. We need to convert into, into dollars or into pesos in Mexico and also into the achieve on the DM, D, in NDC. So it's complex. But I think uh, having uh, this small 
um, goals and this is small success in cities or in states small like Yucatan, it could be a, a, a great a great way to start. Well, well, thank you, thank you very much for these. I uh, I often ask myself, it's uh, if it's the target that comes before the planning and the analysis, or the analysis that come before the target. So in a sort of a chicken and egg uh, uh, circular process, uh, probably an iterative process that you have to keep doing several times. And uh, uh, it takes somebody visionary uh, to, to really set that target and then get everybody in line. And, and there's a lot of that human aspect that, uh, that you mentioned uh, to, to, to make people believe that it's possible uh, and uh, to sort of create uh, capacity, awareness, and to communicate results. So I think that's a, uh, it's, it's a very good point that you made. Um, thank you for that. And last but not least, I would like to uh, uh, invite Melanie um, and, and also thank Melanie and the IEA for uh, helping to co-host this session uh, together. Um, you, um, many of the energy efficiency opportunities uh, in the building sector come from equipment providing buildings with services. Uh, this equipment uses energy, uh, mostly for cooling, heating, lighting. Um, where do you see the most opportunities to accelerate improvements um, and driving down energy intensity uh, when it comes to appliances? Thank you. Um, we've gone, of course, from the, from the planning to the city, to the building, to the systems, and now the things in the buildings. And um, in terms of the, the near-term opportunities, like you say, um, what needs to happen in the next 425 weeks, as we've been hearing, um, a lot of those are actually in the appliances because their turnover rates are very high. Um, they're being used in new and existing buildings, so part of your issue on uh, solutions for retrofits comes from efficient appliances. Um, and, and we know how to drive greater efficiency. We've seen in um, countries where they've had programs for decades that they're saving 15% of their energy consumption from um, having had really good appliance programs. Brian said earlier, we're seeing products that are using half as much energy as they used to use. And what's more, at the same time, what's really, really important is the prices are coming down. So those products are actually, those efficient products are coming down in price. They're becoming more accessible to everybody. And, um, you know, one of the things that we have been talking a lot about is how um, governments, industry, and, and the finance communities can work together to, to continue to improve that. So, you know, when we first started these product efficiency programs 30 years ago, um, there was often quite a conflict between government and industry. There wasn't a shared understanding of the need, uh, as, as there is now. And what's, what's really changed is that we're actually seeing, in the event that we had before this one, you know, we had a, one of the world's biggest appliance manufacturers calling for uniform standards around the world, calling for harmonization. And, and what this does is means that you create absolutely vast markets for more efficient appliances, which makes them cheaper, which makes them accessible to everybody. So that's where the big opportunity is. It's nothing new, it's doing what we know, doing it harder, faster, um, and in a, in a very collaborative way. A, a couple of people have mentioned this, but one of the real advantages of working on appliances too is they're in everybody's home. So if you want to communicate climate with, with people, then it's one of the key ways of doing, of doing that. Um, uh, and one of the things that we heard earlier today also is that um, you know, something we've been working on f with the UK government as part of their presidency for this COP um, is uh, a product efficiency call to action where um, governments are being called on to double the efficiency of a group of core products. Um, and we know that they can do that because the products are already there. We're not asking for innovation here. We're asking just to buy the more efficient products, the ones that are in our markets, the ones that can be produced by local manufacturers, you know, the ones that can be cheaper. Um, so th th there's, there's a, an absolute net gain to everybody in doing this. So, so far, 14 governments from all parts of the world have signed up to this initiative, and um, we're hoping to uh, welcome more members to that. 
but also as well as governments, um, we've got an alliance with EP100, with um, companies like Schneider, um, with appliance manufacturers as well. So these companies can have an impact both in terms of what they produce, but also they're big buyers of equipment. And if they will only buy the more efficient products, then we, again, we have this effect of creating bigger markets for those. We've also heard from India recently about how they use um, government procurement now to buy more efficient products. They, they have said that they, before they started their appliance efficiency programs, the government was buying the least efficient products, not the most efficient products. But by instituting the program, they then had to lead by example. So we, we, we know how to do this, and, it, and it's, 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 um, it's about doing it together now so that we can do it faster. So it's got to be an alliance between governments, between industry, and also you, Philippe, the, the finance community, to help make sure that we can um, drive this just much faster than it's happened in the past. Well, thank you very much, and sorry for a little self-promotion here, but we did fund the project in India that that uh, that you're referring to, at least the lighting component with the ESL. So we're trying our best. Um, but also, I wanted to just pick up on something that Brian said earlier, that still today, um, half of the uh, appliances bought are half the efficiencies of their best, uh, alternative, um, and so there's definitely a, a financing component, a cost component. Uh, you go and buy a fridge, uh, and probably it costs you three hundred dollars more, four hundred dollars more. So you don't really see the savings. So there's a, an element of cost and awareness of how much you could save in the future, but also uh, the lack of regulation. So I, I wanted to just follow up with you on w what are, from your standpoint, uh, the most efficient. Uh, effective uh, sort of policies that a government right now can can take to stimulate um, the take up or the uptake of, of super efficient uh, supply, um, appliances. Thanks. Um, well, for, for a start, only about a third of the appliances being sold or in market, uh, a third of the energy consumption globally of appliances is being covered by mandatory standards. So when people think, think we've done this, it's old hat, we haven't, we've got a lot, a lot more to go. But th the way we see this working best is if we have a package of policies. It's absolutely clear that minimum energy performance standards do, do the majority of the work. But energy labels help engage consumers. Um, and also they have a, a huge impact on manufacturers because you find that Big brands don't want poor labels on their products. So it actually encourages the manufacturers as much as it does um, the consumers. But then we also need to see it forms of incentive to drag that top end of the market. And there are lots of things, you, one, once you've defined what high performance looks like, so you know high performance standard, you can attach all sorts of incentive to it. So what we'd like to see is that there's collaboration globally on defining high performance. But then different countries, different institutions will apply their own incentives. So you mentioned Energy Efficiency Services Limited. They use standards to do bulk procurement. Um, some governments do that. Some, the EP100 companies are, are doing that. Others use them for um, concessional loans for equipment. Um, there's a great example from EBRD of their green technology selector, for example. So um, it's, it's making sure that the the, the minimum energy performance standards, the label, and the high performance are all one trajectory. And we've, we've defined this thing that we're calling the energy performance ladder, um, and that's to bring all of these things together. So everybody's on the same path. They start at a different place. They may go at a different pace, depending on their market. They're all going in the same direction. Thank you for that. And and sometimes from our standpoint, we do fund one energy efficiency project in country X that deals with minimum performance standard, and then we think we're done. Uh, and instead, there's, there's sort of need to uh, revisit that uh, uh, periodically. So uh, I hope we can do more of that. Um, I wanted to go back to uh, the, the two sort of local government representative that, that we have the, the lack of having on the panel today and ask the same question. Um, uh, I'm interested in, in understanding the link between the national level 
uh, uh, planning and targets and, and, and the, the sort of the, the, the adoption of targets and the fit within the general uh, uh, direction given at, at national level. So can you tell us a little bit, uh, perhaps starting with, uh, with you, Saida, uh, how, uh, how much, what's the importance of the national level policies for what you want to do locally? Uh, do you care or <laughs> does it help or can they do a better job or, or do you have lessons you can kind of bring up to them? I don't see anybody from the national level here, so no, you can just are you sure? be honest. <laughs> I'm sure. <laughs> Who's listening to me? Let's check. <laughs> uh, yeah, uh, I think that it should be um, uh, two ways uh, collaboration work. And unfortunately, it's not happening right now. It's harsh in Mexico uh, trying to move into renewables. The federal policy is in kind of on definition right now, but uh, we do have uh, some policies, uh, local policies, that we're trying to encourage, trying to, um, to achieve the introduction of renewables. In Yucatan particularly, particularly it's very important the, the, the change in, into the traditional way of the energy generation, who is a thermoelectric electric is um, playing mostly by diesel or natural gas in the best uh, way. But uh, we need to move to renewables. Also, we do have a lot of potential in eo uh, eolic and solar generation, and is right now a kind of a stop the the um, the promotion of that but we are working into an incentives and a package of incentives to encourage the the, the solar distribution generation not also in 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 domestic in, the, in, in houses but also in commercial and uh, industrial sector so we do have a fund who is financing uh, besides the private sector? It calls a uh, Van Verde company, who is invested, I believe, is 20 million pesos in a fund, who is funding uh, commercial and, uh, and, and, and industrial sector. Uh, and in Merida, we do have an incentive of 20% of reduction on a, a municipal tax. They all the houses pays every year. We do have 20% discount with in, in all the houses that have solar panels. And so so it is a little bit con uh, contribution, but I think it's working. We already in Yucatan have 300 megas of uh, solar uh, distributed generation. So we are trying to balance a little bit this uh, national uh, policy who is working right now but definitely we need to 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 work in a better way within national government is essential to happen right now yes so um I think in Colombia, it's a very specific case because most of climate action on the national level is focusing on deforestation, which is what they should focus on. That's uh, our main contribution to emissions. And it's the main, I mean, as a mega diverse country, we have to focus on forest loss before anything else because we're not only uh, emitting, but we're also losing our main wealth for the future. So I think it's right that the national government focuses their climate change uh, fight on the forests. And there's a little less um, collaboration with cities because I think the large cities that we have are very strong and have very strong institutions such as you and WRI and supporting the work that we're doing. So I think it's, it's good that we're uh, Separated, I do think there's a lot of opportunities for a lot more learning to come from the cities into national policy. National governments tend to look down, at least in Latin America, tend to look down a little on city, on local governments, you know, like they're corrupt and they're 
But I think we're seeing a new <coughs> generation of local governments that have a lot more political clout, at least on the Colombian political scene, uh, that have a lot of legitimacy and that are doing very interesting things. So I think uh, it's, it's time uh, and I see a couple of people from my national government, for the national government to listen in on what local cities are doing and learn from that experience. And hopefully they will. I think we've had a very good situation here at, at COP for that sort of back and forth learning to happen. I do think there's one issue, and I have to be very honest about it, that um, we'd have to work more closely and more, more efficiently on, on the national and the local levels which is the main issue that I think we'll face in buildings efficiency and in climate change in general, which is regulatory capture. Uh, I think we're going to see a lot more resistance than usually comes up in these uh, conversations uh, in terms of building efficiency of new buildings and, and social housing in terms of, uh, it's gonna be more expensive, but you have to make the investment because you want more vulnerable communities to have uh, to live more cheaply in the future and you want climate change policy but there's a lot of resistance coming in from the construction industry um, and in general from fossil fuels in in other areas but i do think we have to have a, a more constructive discussion on how international organizations national governments and local governments are going to push back against regulatory capture uh, particularly in this conversation in terms of construction, but in general with everything we're facing in terms of redistributing public space, giving more space to nature, giving more space to bicycles, giving more space to public transport means we're gonna have a little less space for cars, for fossil fuels, and for certain types of construction. So we need to sort of put, put in um, one uh, front, right? A, a united front against regulatory capture. Um, we're seeing it with our local land use plan. We're seeing it very actively. Sometimes I feel like I'm in a cognitive dissonance situation because you sit here and you're like, of course we want to phase out fossil fuels. And you sit in the city council and it's like, why are you taking away our cars? <laughs> so, so I think these discussions have to be more openly addressed. Well, thank you very much for the plea for more spaces, more public spaces, and for the honesty. Uh, we, we really do appreciate that. So to, uh, as the last uh, um, question, we go back to Vincent as our private sector champion today. Can you leave us with a tangible example of you think of a, of a technology that you think is visionary so that we can leave this, this room uh, with, a, with a good example for us to... Okay. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, let's let's hear what uh, Vincent has to say yeah. about that. <laughs> yeah, I was uh, actually I was uh, there. There are plenty exam of examples, but uh, maybe I will share uh, uh, a visit which I did recently. Uh, I think that was back in July um, into one of our uh, R&D centers. Actually, I'll take this one because. Uh, uh, you know, th there are plenty of examples, but this one I know it uh, deep because I, I visited it uh, recently, and on top of that, I visited it from the ground up, so, and so on. And so that was a, uh, you know, that used to be a factory, which, like 20 years ago, when I started my career at Schneider Electric, it was a place where you didn't want to go work, right? Because uh, it was uh, really ugly, uh, and so on. And it's been entirely renovated um, uh, last year, as a matter of fact. And so just to give a couple of figures, because I think it's, it's quite striking, and, and I wanted to take a retrofit example because of all the, the points you made about that. So, so the energy intensity of that building was above, largely, I think, huh, like 250 kilowatt hour per square meter per year, right? Which is like upper end of, uh, well, you can get even worse, but I mean, that was already pretty bad. Um, so now it's at, uh, it's at, if I'm not mistaken, it's below 40. Below 40, 40, 37, 30, yeah, here, my, uh, my, my technical support, thank you. <laughs> so 37, so, so you, it's minus 80%, but even more, almost, fine. minus 80%. So that's doable, right? And uh, obviously, uh, you, you got a lot of, uh, I mean, you got a part of uh, traditional, you know, uh, uh, rebuilding, right? Insulation work and so, and so on, but you have a lot of digital technologies into that. 
On top of that, it's got like 4,000 square meters of um, rooftop solar, right? Um, and so it's, in fact, it's energy neutral. So, so, so the 37 uh, is like the baseline of what you actually consume, but the reality is that most of the time, uh, it does actually consume zero, or it push back energy on the grid. So it's actually a, a small power plant, right? And uh, and then you have uh, and you and. And then you have um, a very interesting thing because we say, okay, yeah, but solar, you know, is intermittent, it's complicated, so what should we do with batteries? I mean, the, the overall conversation we have on storage is uh, we are very much at the beginning of the conversation because the reality is that when you go beyond the meter, when you go in the buildings, you find a lot of storage. And in this specific example, and this is what's, what killed me, right, honestly, because I, I was... Well, I have to admit that I had not thought of that as something so simple, right? But uh, the whole heating and cooling of the building, like 70% of the energy demand, right, of the building, the whole heating and cooling is done with PV panels uh, fueling a geothermal heat pump, right, which is doing the, the heating, and then all the heat and the cooling is stored in two water tanks, water tanks, right, cost zero two big water tanks that are in the basement, one for heat, one for cool, and you've got the whole heating and cooling which is done with water tanks. So we talk about the cost of storage, zero in this case, for 70% of the energy demand. So that killed me, that really struck me, right? And, um, and, and uh, one last point, because I know you want to stop, but one last point uh, to the people part of uh, that, that you made, that it's so important, uh, re real quick. So I got into the building, right? Then I had some meetings. I got into the buildings, and I felt very hot. And you know why? Because they, set, they, set, they put the set point of the temperature to 26 degrees Celsius, because they say, okay, 26, you can live at 26 degrees. Well, I, now I'm in Boston, it's like at 18, you know, I need to put a, a, a pullover uh, in summer. So, so I put at 26, but as a user, you can, actually, uh, you can actually reduce the temperature, but you don't reduce it to 21, you reduce it to 24, because you're conscious about the, suddenly you're conscious about the impact you create, right? And I think that's a very Thank interesting you. way also to handle it. So technologies Thank you. already exist. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for that. Uh, I need to story. rush because I want to uh, ask uh, Secretary Rivera to help us wrap up uh, and uh, ask the same question uh, to him that we asked to our local government uh, representative. So hopefully he can hear us. Hello. Yes, OK, we can, we can see you. Secretary Rivera, please. Really, really, yeah, really fast and, and, and maybe in a wrap-up uh, approach. Uh, uh, developing energy efficiency measures is different from countries like us in Latin America than uh, developed countries. We have to live in that context. So, and we have uh, two different approaches for uh, existing buildings and for new buildings. Uh, uh, so. For existing buildings, we have to re retrofit and put it in the, the initiatives, the measures. Uh, we have to work with the financial systems, with the financial environment, with the energy saving companies that uh, they uh, bring and offer the services to, to do the retrofitting and the energy efficiency measures. And of course, with the construction uh, um, um, framework, uh, we have to work with the, in the standards and the regulations that we were talking. But I want to, to, to finish what all of this, we have been, you know, we have around 40 energy efficiency standards. We have a national plan, plan for water, solar water heater to have around uh, 1 million square meters in 2050 for, from uh, solar water heater. But in the end, we, we want to share this. We have approved a law back in 2012, and this law has some, uh, uh, points that have been developed, some others have been kept into the, into the paper. So we, what we are doing right now, we put a strategy, we put a roadmap with these specific measures and the involvement of all key stakeholders. And from the national level, I'm speaking here as a national level authority, we're working with local authorities to give them capacity building, to give them some resources to, to, to tackle these tasks as a whole, so we have a, a, a inter multi sector um, entity that is developing this, formulating this strategy, but also it will be implement the strategy. So I think that 
could finish with that. We have to, to, to have a roadmap and we have to get the key stakeholders to develop this uh, roadmap in the next uh, years and align with the SDG 7 in 2030. And, and Secretary Rivera, we, we are here and we are ready to help with uh, whatever you need in, uh, in, uh, in your implementation effort of the roadmap that you have adopted. With this, uh, I'm really sorry, we're not gonna have time for questions because we're already two minutes late. Uh, I really wanna thank you on behalf of the Jeff and the IEA for your time today and uh, please give a round of applause to our panelists. <laughs> Thank you very much.